Thank you all for joining us in this session on how to dentally support offshore patients. Using my experience in remote access dentistry, I've decided to break this session up into six modules. We will start with dental examination, then we will go to dental pain management, gum pain management, facial pain management, how to deal with a front tooth that's just been knocked out, how do we save that particular front tooth, primary facial injury management, and then we will briefly discuss facial trauma and its relationship to airway obstruction. Now we know that dental problems are incredibly common in an offshore environment. And simply put, these problems are associated with tooth pain, gum pain, or facial pain. Now, before we can deal with these common dental issues, we have to examine the patients. So I'll share with you some common examination tips which would make your dental examination so much more easier. What is the ideal position of the patient when you are going to examine or do a dental treatment. Now, if you're working on the lower teeth, <coughs> the lowers are parallel to the floor and uppers are at an angle of 45 degrees. So here you see some of the soft medics working on the lower teeth. You can see the patient with the lower jaw parallel to the floor, uppers at an angle of 45 degrees, using the wall as a backrest and maximum use of natural light. If you're working on the upper teeth, then the position of the patient is like tracheostomy position. Neck extended, head rotated, so you have got a direct visualization of the top teeth. Now this can also be done in the sitting position by tilting the head upwards and backwards so you have direct visualization to the top teeth. <coughs> now working in the mouth is dark and it's wet. So how do we get around the wetness? How do we dry and isolate the area so that we can work better and check better and see better what we are doing? Now if you're working on the upper teeth what you do is you roll some cotton rolls and stick it onto the cheek side of the upper molar teeth. That reduces the flow of saliva from the parotid gland into the mouth. If you're working on the lower teeth, do the same as you did with the upper teeth. So roll some cotton rolls and tuck it onto the cheek side of the upper first molars. Then roll some cotton rolls and stick it onto the tongue side and the cheek side next to the bottom teeth you are going to be working on. <clears throat> now what will the position of the patient be to reduce the saliva pooling on the side where you're going to be working? So if I'm working on the right hand side, I will tilt the head to the left hand side. So the saliva will therefore pool onto the opposite side, so have better isolation in the area where I am working. Now, let us look at dental pain. Dental pain or the tooth pain can be simply divided into three common factors. First, there could be a decay in the tooth causing a hole in the tooth. Secondly, it could be a lost filling. And the third most common factor of tooth pain is a fractured tooth. So what are the essentials or the principles in the management of these common conditions? For the decayed teeth and the lost filling, filling, your principle of management is to clean that area and pack that area. However, if the tooth is fractured, your aim or the principle of management of this condition is to cover and protect the fractured tooth. So let us look at all this a bit more in detail. 
So a patient has a decayed tooth. The patient will come to you and says, Hey doc, I've got this tooth and it's really sensitive. Every time I eat anything hot and cold, it really hurts. And I think I've got a hole in that tooth. Now you look into his mouth <clears throat> and what you see is that there's a big whopping hole in his tooth. Now why did that happen? Bad oral hygiene gave rise to acid. The acid went through the enamel, came to the second layer of the tooth, which is the dentine. And once it reached the dentine, it then spread laterally. So the overhanging enamel then collapsed, giving rise to a big whopping hole. What do you do under these circumstances? What you do is you have to first clean that area and then pack that area. How do we clean that area? The instrument we commonly use is known as an excavator. Now the excavator has a spoony end at one end and a spoony end at the other end. So which part do we use to clean the tooth? We use the concave portion of this instrument commonly called a dental excavator to clean the decay from the tooth. Now how do we do that? Now let us imagine that the tooth has got a decay involving the top part of the tooth and the front part of the tooth. So we take our instrument, we place it into that portion of the decay closest to the center of the tooth at the top. We place it in such a way that the concave side faces forwards because that is the direction where the decay is there. And then we clean away, away, away from the center of the tooth. So what if we have the decay involving the top part of the tooth but going to the back portion of the tooth? Then we take our instrument place it into that part of the decay which is closest to the center of the tooth with the concave side now facing backwards because that is where the decay is and we clean away, away from the center of the tooth. So why do we clean away from the center of the tooth and not towards the center of the tooth? We clean away from the center of the tooth because if this instrument slips, it has less chances of going into the pulp chamber. However, if we do or clean towards, towards the center of the tooth and if this instrument slips, it will readily go into the pulp chamber causing more damage than good. Now let us look at this video. We can see we are cleaning away from the center of the tooth. What is the consistency of this decay? It varies from soft mushy consistency to soft leather to something like dried up Philadelphia cheese. But once you reach the consistency of wood shavings, it is time to stop. Because you shouldn't be too pedantic about cleaning everything out of the tooth. If you do that and by any chance enter the pulp chamber, then you might do more damage. So better let a little amount of decay remain within the tooth than increase the chances of entering into the pulp chamber. Now let us look at this scenario. Now this patient lost her filling. As she lost her filling, the bottom tooth then started pushing and packing all the food into this hole. As the food got packed into this hole, it collected in this hole, released acids and started eating through the tooth structure further and deeper into the tooth structure. But furthermore, as the bottom tooth was like a plunger cusp forcing food into this hole, this food got packed in between the tooth and the gum, pushing itself creating a pocket between the tooth and the gum, causing further irritation and pain in that area. Now in this scenario, 
the medic in question did not have any fancy instruments. So what she did was just use a simple dental floss and a toothbrush and cleaned all the muck outside the tooth, showed the patient how to do that and causing immediate relief in that area because the gums started getting better because you got rid of all that food being packed into the pocket between the tooth and the gums. Now once you've cleaned the tooth, you got to dry the tooth. How do we dry the tooth? We can use any of these methods to dry the tooth. We don't require anything fancy. What we want to do is to make sure that after cleaning the tooth, there is no saliva pooling into the hole which we have just cleaned all the muck out of. And now we have to pack it. We pack it with a temporary filling material. What we use is this instrument which is known as a flat plastic. It is essentially a stainless steel instrument with a flat end at one end and a flat end at the other end. What it does is just transports the temporary filling material from the tube to the tooth. Now if you don't have this material or this instrument, you can use your finger to literally carry this temporary filling material and pop it into the hole which you have just cleaned all the debris from. Now once <clears throat> you place this temporary filling material in this hole, take your finger and pack the filling material in. Underfilling is always better than overfilling. So this is what the tooth will look like. So let us look at this brief video. We've taken our temporary filling material out of the pot. As we scoop it out of the pot, we just massage it with our fingers. That makes the oils come to the surface, makes the material much more easy to work with. Then we pop it into the hole and then take a damp piece of cotton or your finger in, pack it inside, flush it to the sides, allow the top tooth to bite on it, further impregnating this filling into the cavity which you just cleaned from. Now then you ask the patient, how does it feel? <clears throat> and the patient says, it does feel a little bit high. I'm biting on that filling before I'm biting on the rest of my teeth. Now sometimes it's really hard to make out which part of the filling is actually high and interfering in the bite. What you can do is then tell the patient to bite on a piece of carbon paper, tracing paper, charcoal paper, anything like that. As the patient bites on it, anything higher than the level of the tooth will be marked by a prominent black dot. Then what you take is your flat metal instrument, shave off this prominent black dot and keep repeating this process till black dot is no longer on your filling surface. So this is what your filling will look like. So if you take a cross section of the tooth, then that is your temporary filling material. That is the adjacent tooth structure and that is the nerve. This filling will take 20 to 30 minutes to set and the patient can then eat after two to three hours. Now let us look at this scenario. This was on the British Antarctic base of Rothera. The patient in this, in this scenario was complaining of a niggling toothache in summer. Then as winter progressed, his pain got more and more and more. Now in winter, in Rothera, no plane can land, no ship can come in. So this patient could not be medevaced. The medics in question had tried to control his pain with all the antibiotics and anti-inflammatories they had and it was still persistent and getting worse. So we asked them to send a photograph and here you see the loose filling. We asked them to take an x-ray and send it to us. You may not have access to x-rays but let us have a look at this. In the x-ray picture, what we saw was that was a tooth, that was the filling 
and this dark area between the tooth and filling, that is where the filling had leaked and all the leakage had gone in, causing decay in that area and that was exerting this immense inflammatory pressure onto the nerve. So this is what we suggested for them to do. We told them to just pluck that filling out. They removed this loose filling, cleaned all the soft, cheesy, leathery debris. Then we told them to take this mild antiseptic steroid cream called Leather Mix. And we told them to drop a little bit into the bottom part of the hole. Then we suggested take a small ball of cotton, place it in that hole and cover it with a temporary filling material. With that, we managed to control the pain for up to a month and a half till the first plane landed and this patient was then denti whacked to Punta where he had further dental treatment done. Now, what would be the contraindication for doing this treatment? If the patient had had a swelling, then we would not advise this hole to be filled up. That is because we want to encourage the drainage of all the gases and the liquids from the pulp within the tooth or from the dying and necrotic tissue within the tooth to come out and not to block that drainage up with a filling. Now let us imagine we've done this filling, but a day or two after that, the patient starts developing a swelling on that side and the patient then feels that he or she is worse off after the filling than before the filling. What can you do in that situation? What you do is to take that filling out. Now, because we put a small ball of cotton included in that filling, it will be much easier to take this temporary filling out, establish a drainage than if we had not included the small ball of cotton. So this is our gate out clause for this sort of a scenario where there's a possibility of a deep filling and a possibility, small possibility, but a possibility nevertheless of a swelling being caused after the filling. What if you don't have leather mix? If you don't have leather mix, you can take a small ball of cotton, dampen it in clove oil and place it into the depth of the hole and then cover it with a temporary filling material. What if you don't have clove oil, but you have a temporary filling material known as IRM? In which case, you could do the same, take a small ball of cotton, dampen it in the liquid of the cement, because this liquid of the cement contains eugenol. And eugenol is a derivative of clove oil, and you place it in the center of the temporary of the hole, and then cover it with a temporary filling material. What can we do with a fractured tooth? Now we know we got to cover it and protect it. So how do we do that? What we need is an intraoral bandage. And that is another filling material known as glass cyanoma. It is present in a powder and liquid. <clears throat> you take two scoops of powder, two drops of liquid, mix it in to a chewing gum consistency and then place it on the tooth. It approximately has a one minute mixing time and one minute time to be used onto the tooth before it sets. It sticks to the tooth chemically like super glue sticks to the tooth, firmly sticks to the tooth. It has a chemical adhesion with this tooth. Now for this glass cyanoma cement, it's very useful to read the instructions which, which comes with the kit. Why? That is because some of these kits have this bottle which is empty. There is no liquid in the bottle. That is because the acid is already mixed in the powder. The liquid has not leaked out of the bottle. It's just not present. You're supposed to use just normal water. So this bottle is actually a measuring container. And therefore, if you have not read the instructions, you will think that the water has leaked out or the liquid has leaked out and you cannot use this kit. 
However, some kits do have liquid in the liquid bottle container and that is why it's important to read the instructions which comes with this kit. So we mixed it up into a putty-like consistency and now we place it onto the tooth surface, covering and protecting the tooth surface. Now because this filling material sticks so well to surfaces, we must clean our instruments immediately after doing this filling or it's very hard to do that otherwise. Now the next group of patients which cause facial dental pain is gum pain. Now gum pain commonly comes from three causes. These are the most common causes. First is food collecting between the teeth. This may be because there's a broken filling or then when there is two big fillings on adjacent surfaces of the teeth. It could be caused by poor oral hygiene or it can be caused by oral ulcers. Now what are the principles of management? The principles of management of both of these two common causes of gum pain is to clean that area show the patient how to maintain that cleanliness in that area and possibly some antibacterial mouthwash to help in the healing. In the case of oral ulcers, your principles of management would be to provide pain relief and to manage the underlying conditions which is causing all these issues. So the patient who has got a gum problem or inflamed gums will come to you and says, hey doc, my gums bleed. They bleed every time when I brush and floss. Now because they are so painful, I've actually stopped brushing and flossing in that area, but that has made the condition get worse and worse. Now when you look inside his mouth, what you will see is inflamed gums in that area. Inflamed gums gums which bleed when you as soon as you touch them. Why did that happen? Because oral hygiene was poorly maintained. Food and debris collected on the teeth, <coughs> that irritated the gums. Irritated gums got inflamed. Inflamed gums are softer. As soon as a brush and floss touches it, it starts bleeding. Patients get scared and they floss and brush even less. So what you have to tell them is that if it is bleeding in any particular area, to brush and floss better in that area, not less, better in that area, then you can take some corsodal mouthwash or corsodal gel. Now, if you don't have corsodal mouthwash or corsodal gel, you can use warm salt water. Then you flush that area with corsodal mouthwash or gel or warm salt water and show the patient how to maintain good oral hygiene. Oral ulcers. Oral ulcers, the patient will come to you and says, hey doc, I've got multiple ulcers in my mouth and on my lips. My tongue and my lips burn. They burn even more when I eat anything spicy or when I drink fizzy drinks. They may give you a positive exposure history to a strong sun, exposure to wind, exposure to dry air. Now, when you look in the mouth, you could see multiple encrusted ulcers all over the mouth, sometimes on the tongue, sometimes on the gums. Now, why did this happen? This could be happening for multiple reasons. It can happen because of environmental reasons, exposure to UV, to harsh sunlight, exposure to cold wind. It could happen due to body factors like dehydration when you're exposed to high altitude or constant long work out in the environment. You tend to lose a lot of water. It can happen due to allergy. Patients are allergic to form some forms of lip balm that contains PABA, could be allergic to some food or could be due to stress. When exposed to long hours of work, excess physical activity, change in diet, all that can lead to oral ulcers. So how do we treat these patients? We check that A, that they're using lip balm. 
And if they're using lip balm, what sort of lip balm are they using? Do, are they SPF 50 or uh, SPF 30 to 50 or above? Are they really, where have they actually got the lip balm from? So the quality of the lip balm is also important. The lip balm may say it's PABA free, it is SCF 30 and above, but depending on where the patient has purchased the lip balm, this may not be true. And very often we suggest using sunblock, something like what cricketers use rather than lip balm to protect the lips. Next, we have to create an oral environment to allow the rapid healing of these ulcers and antibacterial mouthwashes and gels can help in this respect. We may have to provide certain degree of pain relief. So if you have lignocaine cream or lignocaine gel, that mixed with the moisturizers on the lip will help in providing some degree of pain relief. We should be able to protect the mouth by advising our patients to wear a buff or a face covering not only will it protect the lips against the harsh exposures of sunlight from the wind, but it'll also moisten and warm the air around, helping it in healing rapidly. But most important is that we have to treat this patient holistically. We have to check the general health of the patient, make sure that the patient is sufficiently hydrated, Make sure that the patient is eating and his diet is sufficient and balanced. And if nothing works, then rest and recovery if possible. Oral thrush. These patients will come to you and says, Hey doc, my mouth is sore and painful. I'm finding difficulty in swallowing. When I look into my mouth, it's all red and white patches all over my mouth. It's steadily getting worse. They may give a positive history of being asthmatic and using steroid inhalers. When you look into the mouth, their mouth may be full of red and white patches from the tongue to the roof of the mouth to the oropharyngeal area. Now, why do we get oral thrush? This again can happen due to multiple factors. If the patient is asthmatic, and he or she is using a steroid inhaler, but not rinsing her mouth immediately after using the steroid inhaler, that could cause oral thrush. Together with an environment where patients are exposed to stress, change in diet, medication, underlying medical history, all those would propagate the formation of oral thrush. So how do we manage this patient? We manage this patient by first trying to prevent it. So if they are using steroid inhalers, we strongly suggest to them that after using the inhaler to rinse the mouth immediately after using it. We create an environment in the mouth which prevents further bacterial infection from getting in, worsening this condition by giving oral corsodal mouthwash or corsodal gel. If you have access to antifungal gel, you can then think about using antifungal gel. You, natural yogurt creates or changes the oral pH, which is more conducive for healing of the mouth. But again, we have to look at this patient holistically. We have to make sure that the patient is sufficiently hydrated, that the patient is eating some sufficient amount and the diet is well and truly balanced and rest and recovery if possible. So our next scenario is when we deal with facial pain. Now the most common factors of facial pain is that when you have a tooth abscess, when you have a gum abscess, or when you have a wisdom tooth abscess. Now what are the principles of management of these patients? The principle of management is essentially the same. Essentially, we tell the patients not to put anything hot extraorally to avoid extraoral heat. We have to give the patients antibiotics and anti-inflammatories and make sure that the patient is consuming sufficient food and fluids. These patients will likely need some sort of a medivac. So therefore, tooth abscess. When a patient has a tooth abscess, the patient comes to you and says, Hey doc, 
Whenever I eat anything, my tooth really hurts. As soon as I bite on it, and then it gives me a shooting pain. And therefore, I know exactly which tooth it is because when I put any pressure on it, it really hurts. They could often say that now that used to happen before, but now I'm just getting a constant throbbing ache in connection with that tooth. They may also tell you that this tooth was not necessarily sensitive to hot and cold. That when it's anything hot and cold, it, there is no sensitivity, but there's just constant throbbing ache in connection with this tooth. When you look into his mouth, you may find a swelling in the soft tissue adjacent to this tooth. This tooth might have a big hole in connection with it or a big filling in connection with it. Now, why did this happen? Bad oral hygiene resulted in acid. This acid went through the enamel, through the dentine, came close to the pulp. It irritated the pulp. The pulp got inflamed. The inflamed pulp died. There's dead meat now in the center of the tooth. This dead meat releases acids and gases. These acids and gases leak out and they dissolve the bone around the apex of the tooth, forming a periapical abscess. So whenever the patient bites on this tooth, the pressure goes through and it stimulates the nerves in the bone around the periapical abscess. And these nerves in the bone around the periapical abscess do have proprioceptive receptors and therefore the patient can locate which tooth is causing him the pain. So how do we manage these teeth? We put the patient on antibiotics and anti-inflammatories and make sure we don't put anything hot on the outside of his face because the swelling will then migrate to the outside and you'll get a whopping facial swelling in the circumstances. Then we want to rest that tooth. So we then put the patient on a liquid diet or a soft diet consumed from the opposite side of his mouth. We want to make sure that his top and bottom teeth don't contact onto the painful side. So when he's not eating or resting during the day, we tell him to bite on a piece of gauze from the opposite side of his mouth, preventing his, him contacting the infected tooth and the top tooth together, reducing the pain in that area. This patient will need Medivac. Gum abscess. This patient will come to you and says, hey doc, I've got a gum boil. Now when you look into his mouth, sure enough, there is a gum boil. Now why did that happen? bad oral hygiene around the tooth. This caused irritation of the gums. The irritated gums get inflamed. Now inflamed gums <coughs> are at a higher level than normal gums. So they form a pocket between the tooth and the gums. It's quite hard to clean in that pocket. So more food and debris builds up in this pocket. This causes further irritation to the wall of the pocket. The wall of the pocket gets so inflamed that it blocks its own opening up. So now you have a cave where food and debris is collected. Now we have to differentiate this gum abscess from a tooth abscess. So in a case of a tooth abscess, as we discussed, tooth dies, dead meat in the center of the tooth, dead meat releases acids and gases, dissolves the bone around the apex of the tooth and this dissolved mucky stuff around the apex of the tooth has to decompress somewhere. So that decompresses as a gum boil. But this gum boil caused by the death of this tooth is much further away from the crown of the tooth than a gum boil caused by poor oral hygiene. And that is how you know, differentiate between a dental abscess and a gum boil. Now, how do we treat this patient? We give them antibiotics and anti-inflammatories. We can incise and drain that abscess. We can take a nice white bone needle, place it between the tooth and the gums, cure it that area, removing all the debris in that area, and then flush that area with costal mouthwash, costal gel, or warm salt water, getting rid of all that debris in there, allowing 
drainage from that area and hopefully some degree of recovery. Wisdom teeth abscess. So the patient will come to you and says, hey doc, I'm finding it very hard in opening my mouth. There's excruciating pain behind my last tooth and the area there is inflamed and swollen. When you look into his mouth, what you could see is this little white bit and an angry red bit. <coughs> what has happened is that the wisdom tooth is only partly in his mouth. So that is what you are seeing. And this partly erupted wisdom tooth is surrounded by a flap of gums. There is a pocket between this tooth and this gums. So food and debris are collected in this pocket because it's really hard to clean in this pocket behind this wisdom tooth. So that builds up. This irritates the wall of the pocket. The wall of the pocket gets so irritated and inflamed that it closes its own opening up, resulting in a wisdom tooth abscess. Then the top teeth then bite on it, worsening the situation. What can you do in these circumstances? What you can do is, of course, you can give antibiotics and anti-inflammatories. You can take an outer plastic of a vent flown cannula, slide it between the tooth and the gums, and then flush that area with warm salt water, costal mouthwash, costal gel, to get rid of all that debris in this pocket between the tooth and the gums, hoping to give some relief to the patient. Which are the antibiotics which we commonly use in dentistry? Now, most of the infections or the dental infections are caused by anaerobic bacteria. So 50% is caused generally by anaerobic bacteria. The next majority is caused by a combination of anaerobic and aerobic bacteria. It is a small few which are caused by aerobic bacteria. Therefore, the antibiotics which we commonly use in dentistry is basically augmentin, which is a common combination of amoxicillin and clavulonic acid, or you can use amoxicillin in combination with metronidazole. <coughs> now, if the patient is allergic to penicillin, then the next choice of antibiotic is clindamycin. And if you don't have access to clindamycin, it's metronidazole mixed with erythromycin, clarithro or azithromycin. One of the painkillers which we use in dentistry commonly is ibuprofen, 400 milligrams three times a day. You can increase this to up to 600 or 800 milligrams three times a day. And you can combine this with paracetamol also to establish some degree of pain relief. So next module is dental trauma. Now, dental trauma is commonly three causes. The three most common causes of dental trauma is a broken tooth, a front tooth getting knocked out, or a broken jaw. Now, what are the principles of management of these conditions is, for a broken tooth, we already discussed that, and that is to cover it and protect it. Now, if a front tooth gets knocked out, our principle or our aim is to place this front tooth back into the mouth as soon as possible. If we place it in within the first hour, the success rate is 80%. After the first hour, the success rate drops to 20%. Now, if the person in question is not comfortable to insert this front tooth back in quickly, then they have to transport this patient quickly in the correct way to the medic who can do that. And the transportation of this nocta tooth in the correct way is very, very important. And then the patient goes to the dentist. And we'll discuss this more in detail. For the broken jaw, our principle of management is the normal principles of A, B, C, D, E, and stabilization of the patient and medivacking this patient. So what happens or what do you do if the front tooth gets knocked out? If the front tooth gets knocked out, we need to splint this tooth back in place. And the splint which we commonly use 
is we use the nasal clip of a face mask as our dental splint. So when a front tooth gets knocked out, a blood clot forms. It takes four to eight minutes for it to form, but once it forms, it's important for us to remove this blood clot and stimulate bleeding to help in the take up of the re-implanted front tooth. So when we take this blood clot out, we gently take it out using a tweezer and irrigation. We do not scrape the sides of the soft tissues or the bone while doing this <coughs> because that area is full of living cells which are very important to us. Local anesthesia is preferable but not essential. Time is of the essence. So we hold the tooth by the crown. We do not touch the root at all. We just hold the tooth by the crown. <coughs> then we spend 10 seconds of gently washing the root of any visible debris. We do not scrub it. We do not rub it. Just gentle irrigation to remove any visible debris. Then we check the adjacent teeth to make sure that when you insert the tooth, you put it the right way round. It would be embarrassing if you put it the wrong way around. We push it into the socket with firm digital pressure. So we take the tooth, put firm digital pressure and push it into the socket till it is in alignment with the adjacent teeth. Then we tell the patient to bite on a plastic ballpoint pen, wooden spatula for four to eight minutes. While biting on the spatula, what happens is a blood clot forms around the tooth. So the whole oral environment gets much more conducive for working. There's less blood in the mouth, less saliva in the mouth. Your splint will hold better. It'll stick better to the teeth. So these or this four to eight minutes is the time you use to make your splint. That is your time saving tactic. So this four to eight minutes when the patient is biting on a plastic barrow or a wooden spatula, that is the time you use to make your splint. Now, how long is the splint? This splint is one or two teeth longer than the naughty tooth. So one or two teeth. Where do you place the splint? This placed splint is placed in the midpoint between the gum line to the top of the teeth. So mid portion of the teeth. What do you do with the ends of the splint? You tuck it between the adjacent teeth. What if you don't have a nasal clip of a face mask? You can use a steri strip. You can use surgical or wound glue. You can use a combination of a steri strip and wound glue to hold it in place. Then, now how do we hold or fix the splint onto the tooth surface? Now remember the dental filling material <clears throat> which we used to cover and protect a fractured tooth that is what we use to stick the splint onto the tooth surface. So we take two scoops of water, two drops of liquid, one minute to mix it with, one minute to use it. And after mixing it, so we've read our instructions, we've taken the required scoops of powder, the right proportion of powder, the right proportion of liquid. All this comes in the kit, the powder, the liquid, the mixing pad, the measuring spoon, <clears throat> sometimes a spatula or a mixing spatula is included and sometimes it's not. If it's not included and if you haven't got it, you can use the back portion of a spoon to mix the powder and liquid. So you mix the powder and liquid in correct proportions. It forms like a putty-like consistency. Like so, you mix a good amount of it and then you take a large portion of it and pop it on top of the splint covering the tooth and you place it on all the teeth including the naughty tooth firmly so it will firmly hold the splint onto the tooth surface. Then ideally the patient must be medivaced. What will the dentist do? The dentist will start root canal treatment and then take the splint out. If this is done in the first hour, the success rate is 80%. After the first hour, the success rate drops to 20%. What if you are unable 
to re-implant the tooth. How do we transport this avulse tooth? This avulse tooth can be transported in the patient's mouth by placing it in the floor of the mouth or in the vestibule. That is a space between the teeth and the cheek here. Or if the patient is unable to do that, you tell the patient to spit in a bowl or a, or a container, spit in that and then place your tooth in the patient's own saliva. If that is not possible, then you transport it in milk, which is another good medium to transport the tooth. Now, if the patient cannot be medevaced after you put the splint on, you place the patient on broad spectrum antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, check the patient's tetanus booster situation. The patient must maintain scrupulous oral hygiene. Make sure it's nice and clean around the tooth. If you have costal mouthwash or costal gel, this is to be used for at least seven days after re-implanting the tooth. Till the patient is medevaced, the patient is kept on a liquid diet to prevent any further injury on the tooth. <coughs> what if you do not have access to the nasal clip of a face mask? What you can also use is Compede splint. You can just wrap a silver foil around and hold the tooth in place. Or if the medivac is going to be very, very soon, place the tooth into the extraction or aval socket area. Tell the patient to bite on a piece of gauze and the patient can then promptly be medivaced. Facial injury. We'll just discuss the primary management of facial injury. Now, facial injury caused by the broken jaw, the patient will find that there is difficulty in opening his or her mouth. When you tell the patient to open the mouth, the patient will be unable to the open the mouth or the mouth will deviate to one particular side when the patient tries to open the mouth. There could be a progressively increasing facial swelling. When you put your fingers onto the lower jaw and try to move the lower jaw, you will feel a sensation like sandpaper rubbing against each other. When you take your finger and place it along the lower border of the mandible, you might find a step like deformity. Now, what if you're in an area where you think that there is a possibility of a fractured mandible? Is there any test what you could do? Yes, it is known as a wooden spatula test. What you do is you take a wooden spatula, tell the patient to bite on his or her molar teeth, Give the end of the spatula to the patient. Tell the patient to try to twist and break it. If the patient is unable to do that, then there is a high likelihood that there is a fracture of the lower jaw on that side. If the patient is able to do it on that side, try to do it on the opposite side. So here we take a wooden spatula, tell the patient to bite on the back, on the molar teeth, try to twist and break it. If the patient is able to do it on that side, then you repeat it on the opposite side. <coughs> right, so let us look at primary stabilization of a facial injury. An accident happens, resulting in a fracture mandible. We obviously transport the patient to a safe zone. Now your first objective will be to make sure that the patient does not faint and the patient might not have eaten or drunk anything for a long period of time. Of course, if you have IV access, that is a different situation, but if you do not and a medivac is delayed, you might have to give some sort of food or fluid to the patient. Now, your first challenge would be, what if you are faced with a floating fractured mandible and the patient is unable to swallow and you do not have IV access? What you can do is grasp the tip of the tongue, pull his tongue downwards and forwards, expose the posterior third of his tongue, squirt some gel into the posterior third of his tongue, raise his tongue upwards and backwards. This forms a natural channel, allowing the patient to swallow the gel you squirted onto his tongue surface. Now, now we've got to transport this patient from the area of injury and medivac him. So therefore, we have to stabilize this patient. But you may not have access to any splints or you might not even have the skills to do this. So what is a simple way to do this? Now, the simple way is that the body has given you the splint 
and this splint is the intact top jaw. What you do is you pull the fractured upper jaw against the intact top jaw, allowing the top jaw to hold the bottom jaw and you hold these, <coughs> these jaws against each other by using a barrel bandage. Now, how do we tie a barrel bandage? So we take a long tubular piece of cloth. The center part of this tubular piece of cloth is placed below the lower jaw. Then you tell the patient to hold the lower jaw against the upper jaw, supporting this long tubular piece of cloth. Now you've got two ends here. Take one end and it goes all the way to the top of your head and cross it just over the ear. Now this is the foundation knot of your barrel bandage. You have to make sure that this crossed area doesn't go up, down, front or back and remains just above the ear. To help you do that, tell the patient to support the barrel bandage both along the lower jaw and at the top of the head. Now you've got two tail ends. Take the front tail end, goes just above the eyebrow over the forehead. The back tail end goes behind the occiput of the skull and it crosses over the opposite side. And that is where you tie your knot and tuck the tail ends in. So that is what your barrel bandage must look like. So we look at it here, you take your long tubular piece of cloth, goes below the chin, along the lower part of the mandible, top of the head, crosses over the ear, your foundation knot, one end goes over the forehead, the other the back of the head, and you cross it over the opposite ear and you tie the knot there. So that is how you tie a barrel bandage. Now, this barrel bandage has other uses also. If you have a major facial injury like so, a gaping wound in the cheek, you clean that area up, you take a piece of gauze and you tuck it between the teeth and the cheek in the what we call the vestibule area. You take another piece of gauze, place it into the soft tissue injury, place the third piece of gauze over this whole compacted area and then you can hold that into place by using a barrel bandage. How do we transport this patient? We do not transport this patient in a supine position. The supine position is bad for this patient because, for example, if you have a bilateral fracture mandible, this will get displaced posteriorly, take the tongue with it, which will obstruct the nasopharynx in this area and compromise the airway. If the patient has a major mid-face fracture, a blood clot could form and that could go in and compromise the airway. So these patients should not be transported in the supine position and must not be left unsupervised. How do we transport this patient? We transport this patient in a lateral trauma position or a lateral prone position. In this position, we place them in such a way that the wound injury is placed superiorly so you can always keep it under observation. If you want to transport them for short distances, then you transport them in a semi-prone position. And this is the best to protect their airway. So this comes on to our last module, which we basically discuss airways and facial traumas. Airway obstruction is common in facial trauma. It could be partial, it could be complete. Why is it caused? It could be caused by edema in the pharyngeal and the peripharyngeal area here. It could be caused by obstruction from foreign bodies, from teeth, from mucus, from blood clots, or it could be caused by displacement of the bone taking the soft tissue with it. So therefore, how do we maintain the airway? We maintain the airway using two particular techniques, which is the semi-definitive airway strategy or the definitive airway strategy, which is the surgical airways. We won't be discussing these. What we will be discussing is the semi-definitive airway strategies, trying to protect the airway, which is the means and the skills you have at your disposal. And position is so important in this. If the patient is conscious, the position is sitting with his head tilted forwards to allow postural drainage. If the patient is unconscious, you put the patient in recovery on the lateral prone position or in the lateral trauma position. 
Now, if the patient is conscious and he is sitting with his head tilted forward to propagate postural drainage, and if you want to open the patient's mouth, it's quite hard if the patient is unable to open the mouth or unwilling to open the mouth. In which case, what we use is the cross-fingered grip. What we do is to take our thumb and index finger, place it between the molar teeth and cross it. So the thumb exerts a force upwards, index finger exerts a force downwards. That way we are able to open the mouth, check what's happening inside the mouth, remove any blood clots, use our suction to clean the mouth up. If necessary, do a controlled visible finger sweep making sure no foreign body is pushed down his right bronchus into his airways. Then we may have to use extra glottic airways. But for facial traumas, it's hard sometimes to use or often to use extra glottic airways, partly because of the displacement of the bone in that area. So theoretically, it's been advised that if you're faced with an unstable fracture of the upper jaw, or bilateral fracture of the lower jaw, then you should think of doing a surgical airway sooner rather than later. But we also know that doing a surgical airway is a hard procedure to do. It is supposed to be the most technically challenging procedure combat medics have faced with. It has a failure rate of 33% amongst medics and 12% amongst doctors in failed conditions. So therefore, my objective is to at least briefly for you all to be aware of the semi-definitive airway strategies. For the upper jaw, what happens is that in a facial trauma, the upper jaw is displaced downwards and backwards. As it gets displaced downwards and backwards, it closes or compromises the nasopharyngeal area. As it is displaced, backwards and downwards, the patient gets a dish face abnormality. When you look at the patient, you might think that the patient is keeping his or her mouth open. But actually, it is because this upper jaw is pushed downwards and backwards and the patient is gagging on the back teeth. That is why this gives it this part mouth open appearance. So in this case, the airway is opened by pulling the upper jaw upwards and forwards. In the case of the mandible, when you have a bilateral fracture of the mandible, this mandible gets displaced downwards and backwards. This takes the tongue, which is attached to this mandible, downwards and backwards, and this blocks the oropharyngeal area of the airway. So what you can do is to pull this jaw upwards and forwards, <coughs> and then hold it in that location, and sometimes maybe tie a small wire ligature around the fractured fragment just to hold the jaw, this floating fractured mandible in its forwards and anterior position, opening the airway in the oropharyngeal area. And that completes our session. Thank you very much.